Over a lifetime, the wind has deliberately composed a whimsical tune in my soul. As a child, I built a square rigger from repurposing a shipping pallet, some fence palings, and a sheet stolen from Mum's linen cupboard. The Derwent Valley in Tasmania forms a perfect wind tunnel for the Roaring Forties. These blasts would hit the front of our house as they squeezed through the slim gap between the side of our home and a six-foot paling fence, they were intensified, even though a few of the palings were missing. Within the shelter of the low-lying cotton tree headland on the southeast, flat water takes on a slick appearance lying about the wind's strength. I have on board my son Peter, wife Denise and my pet Cavoodle Millie as we make our way from No Jewel Road boat ramp towards the Marushi River heads. The plan was to settle Denise and Millie up the beach in the shelter of a dune while Pete would catch her some action shots on the GoPro. Forties are strong westerly winds found in the southern hemisphere between 40 and 50 degrees south. The westerly air currents are produced by air being forced from the equator towards the South Pole. They're squeezed and intensified by the Earth's rotation and then unimpeded by the lack of land masses in the Great Southern Ocean. The Roaring Forties were important to ships sailing the route from Europe to the East Indies or Australasia during the sailing age. In, in recent times, yachtsmen favour these winds for around-the-world voyages and record-breaking global circumnavigation. Because this was the first time out since rebuilding the propeller shaft, I'm keen to get some close passes filmed while under power, chugging along smoothly minus the bearing growl and the wildly whipping shaft that was an issue before the restoration work. A moment's lapse in concentration resulted in the boat backing up into the sandbank, catching the trailing edge of the rudder, and to a sickening crack rending off a third of the rudder blade. Initially, I thought this would put a premature end to the day's sailing, but having come this far, I decided to test it out with reduced steerage and see what would happen. If you keep your boat in the shed, nothing will ever break, and you will have experienced little and learnt nothing. I've always been one to push the boundaries at every level, and occasionally something has to yield. These days I live in southeast Queensland where the trade winds prevail. The trade winds blow mainly from the southeast in the southern hemisphere. The trade winds have been favoured by captains of sailing ships across the world's ocean for centuries and enabled colonial expansion into Australasia, allowing trade routes to become established across the Pacific Oceans. While they are generally not as potent as the Roaring Forties that I tried to tame as a young man in Tasmania, the trade winds often deliver a favourable sailing breeze of 15 to 20 knots. They lack the bitter cold edge of their southern counterparts. At times they can gust up to 30 knots or more, but they rarely, if ever, go beyond that. There is a yearning to re-encounter the sting of the salt spray ripped from the cresting waves that I experienced windsurfing in the Bass Strait in northern Tasmania. Then there are moments of eerie silence while briefly relaxing in the trough of a wave, awaiting the next swell that would elevate me back into the westerly blast and propel me back towards the shore. When my Predict Wind forecasting app starts to edge into the orange and red zones, my pulse increases slightly, and I find myself contemplating heading out onto the river in moonlight, with her sails heavily reefed and flogging in protest. On the first attempt at sailing with a broken rudder, 
Moonlight was careening downwind, wildly out of control, jibing recklessly, resulting in a near capsize and nosing into the sandbank. A second attempt had me carefully trimming the sails on a broad reach to find that the boat ended up perfectly balanced at the helm, even allowing me to release the tiller and go forward to make some adjustment to the racing lines. Interestingly, the sailing performance actually seemed to improve once you got enough hull speed up. It was a little bit different when you were running at low speed and didn't really have any steerage at all. After several passes of the shoreline, it was clear that going about could be achieved easily with plenty of boat speed. Still uncontrollable jibing and a broach would result from a brief lapse in concentration. I almost capsized, taking in huge slurps of water over the gunnels, and then limping back to shore to pump her dry. I was thankful for my experience in my teens taking small sailboats out in extreme conditions and tipping them over just to see what would happen and learning how to recover from being bottom up. There's a lot to think about when you're trying to navigate with a broken rudder, enough to make you forget something basic like raising the centreboard in time. I was thankful for the bolt that my mentor advised me to put through the keel horizontally to cope with this type of error without splitting it asunder. So with enough excitement, thrills and spills for one day, we put into practice the old maxim that gentlemen don't sail upwind, pointing the bow back upriver to the boat ramp.
refurbished propeller shaft has been adequately tested and passed with flying colours. My curiosity about sailing the boat in heavy winds with the freshly tweaked gunter rig reefing system has also been satisfied. Predict Wind got it right. My desire for pushing the boundaries is quenched for the time being, creating lasting pictures in my mind and a few bruises on the rudder. Until next time, when the wind map compels me to respond according to my DNA. Back home in the workshop, it's time to assess the damage and find some remedies. Even though this is a fresh break, the hue and pine has lost much of its distinctive odour from the unique oils it contains. The timber has sheared in a way that has created an ideal surface for regluing. There are scars from previous damage to the rudder, which I glued and doweled but this time I feel just gluing with strong flexible epoxy will provide a permanent fix that will be stronger than the original wood. I measured up the blade for a complete replacement and Pete will locate a suitable piece of hewn once he gets back to Tasmania. While he's at it, I've asked him to see if he can find a suitable grown knee to replace the plywood breast hook in the bow. I've never been happy with the plywood one. Notice the centreboard needs a grind back and recoating with metal shield paint. I'm learning to trust the new technology which does not require a primer. Time will tell and I'm willing to experiment. This old and deeply pitted piece of metal is an essential part of the boat's character and history. This was the original centreboard in a boat built by John Philp and it's now probably a hundred years old or more. a second or two, a um, minute or two perhaps, and come back and you can lay it up again. Um, some sort of reaction there. The day's work isn't complete until the soldiers washed off everything before putting it back under cover. In the garage's heat approaching 50 degrees at times, salt and moisture can cause catastrophic breakdown of the galvanising. <laughs> 